I'm sure that since you were little, you've always heard the phrase that reading is good for you, that uh, reading is food for the brain. But have you actually thought about this phrase? Have you actually thought about how reading has helped you over the years? Or have you been reading just because everybody told you to read? And do you read normally nowadays even because you are told to read things for work, but you don't really have time for entertainment reading um, that you would like to do because you think you don't have the time or you cannot make this time and you only read in the summer, for example. Well, I'm going to tell you in this video today, to start the first video of the year, I'm going to tell you about some books or the books I read last year and finished because I read a lot more, but they're not here. The books that I read and finished last year in 2021 that actually not only changed my life, but they contributed with my critical thinking. So if you want to know how this works, if you want to know what I read and you're curious and you want some tips for next year, for this year, for 2022, this video is for you, my friend. Hello Gothic friend, this is Alice and you are in Gothic land, a place where your soul meets its true self. Welcome to 2022, happy new year, happy life, happy new year's resolutions. Uh, I hope you're doing very well, I hope that you have plenty of projects and I hope that, I hope to help you this year with your Gothic journey as well. And today what I want to talk to you about is about the books that I read in 2021 that are actually gothic books, some of them are fiction, some, some of them are not non-fiction, but they all helped me and they all contributed with my critical thinking, which is something that a lot of us miss out or, or we don't know about. If uh, somebody doesn't point that out to us, uh, we can be missing out a lot of um, aspects about critical thinking. But before we go into details and what critical thinking is, if you're not sure, I have other videos from last year that you can go back to. But if you're not sure and you want to make the most of your Gothic readings and you want to find out more about the Gothic, then I have the perfect download for you. I have a free PDF, how to improve your critical thinking through the Gothic tests. And it's free. It's a presentation that I have for you, it's a downloadable presentation and there you can see how to use this text to improve your language skills but also how to make the most of your critical thinking. And it's not only for people whose English is a second language, it's also for people who, when, you know, who, people who read and that when they read they actually I'm missing out on some aspects and how to make the most of the reading. So that will put the link to that. It's called Improve Your Critical Thinking and Language Skills with the Gothic. And it's a downloadable. Right, so today I want to tell you all about my books, my 2021 books. And I'm going to start with the first one. Now I have to tell you that when I read, I don't just read a book and then I finish it. I have this new thing, when well, I've had this thing for a few years now, that um, I start reading a book, but then I read another one. I might read different books at different times of the day. You know, if it's the evening time, I might be reading short stories because it's dark, it's night. My short stories are gothic or, or uh, horror. And then I have my investigation books that I read during the daytime. So. My books, my reading is a little bit all over the place. Also, since I became a more um, intentional writer since uh, October 2021, a more, um, as I said, a more um, intentional writer for Medium. If you want to find me there, you can also read all my articles on Medium. Not so much on my blog at the moment, I'm more on this other platform because there are a lot of other writers and we talk to each other and we help each other out and it's a beautiful place. So 
since I am more intentional, as, as I was saying, I am more intentional with my reading because of medium, you also read all the people's work and then you quote it and then you learn new things. So as well as my books, I've been reading a lot of other articles from a lot of other people, uh, writers and, and professionals from different areas, which is super, super interesting. I was reading a lot before as well, but like, you know, if you think about it, we all read in a way that is scattered all over the place. And during the day, we read a lot. If we could actually kind of uh, trace how much we read you will find out that we read quite a lot it's just that we're not we don't do it in like solid solid blocks but what i'm gonna do today exactly is tell you about the books that i actually read and finished and there are others that i have unfinished which is the pile actually that you have there behind the little this little lump that pile is the books that i've started i've not finished maybe because when i buy them i actually have a look at the first two two or three pages and then I get hooked and I can put the book down but that's not a plan you have to really be a little bit intentional with your readings which is also actually something that we will talk about another time but for this video for the purposes of this video I'm gonna give you more or less in what I think and what I remember and when I was looking back at my videos and my notes what I think is the right order for the books that I read last year and they're not 12, it ideally would be, in an ideal world, would be 12, so one book per month. But as you can see, some of them are longer, some of them are shorter, some of them are more intense, some of them are, you can read them quicker. Um, so it will all depend on how you're feeling and how the book actually engages you as well. So what I'm going to tell you in this video is not just what I read, but also why I read it. So there's also, for me, there's also an intention. There's always a purpose on what I do. Why I read those books and what did I learn from those books, what I learned from those books. And when I'm saying what I learned, it's not just the stories or whatever, but it's how these stories, how these books changed the way I thought and how they contributed with my, criti my critical thinking. So we're going to begin with Obviously, Tracy Fahey, one of my favorite writers. I started the year reading these also because I did an interview. I interviewed Tracy right at the start. If you want to know more about this, go to Medium because I have articles about what I did last year. I have one uh, regarding wrapping up the 2021 Gothic Year article. What we have here is a chapbook. It's what we call a chapbook because it's short. It's got different chapters. It's a chapbook that goes with the release of uh, the Umaha Relief Manu that I read the previous year and I already talked about that one. Okay, I'm looking at my notes as always, it's a bit further away to take the notes. But that's a chapbook that goes with that, uh, although I bought them separately. Um, and in fact, this one, uh, it got to me, so Tracy sent it to me at the time. So it's a, a sign of book with a dedication uh, that Tracy sent to me, to my dear friend and follow, Sorry, follow now. To my dear friend and fellow gothic sister, Alicia, with love, Tracy. I love when people dedicate books to me. It's just great. It's, you know, our narcissistic side loves it. <laughs> so this, this book, why I read that? Well, I read this because it follows this other one that I was mentioning before. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss anything out. But also because I knew it had notes. And you know, those who know me, you know how much I love notes from from the writer. I, I like picking on the writer's brains and I will, I like to know when I'm reading, if I'm actually right in my guessing, in my theories of why the writer wrote these things, whatever it is that they wrote. So what we have here are short stories. Some of them are based on folklore. Some of them are based on experiences. Um, but what is important with Tracy is that she always uh, concentrates um, in the uncanny. One of the the aspect, one of the characteristics of Tracy writings is the aspect of the uncanny. And this is what we can see here. So why is this important? How did this help me with my critical thinking? It actually defined uh, very well, not only because of the notes at the beginning, but also because you can see what she tries to do here. And she does that very successfully with the short stories is to talk about the uncanny but in our everyday lives in in what is familiar becoming unfamiliar of the homes of our bodies of the noises outside of other people's lives and this is something that you see through all the different stories 
it's about stories we believe it's about deep desires it's about folklore it's about you know tracy uh, weaves very nicely all these stories around these topics of what is there in our everyday lives but we're not necessarily aware of it so i recommend you this book because it's a modern writer and we don't always have to read classics you know reading people like tracy you're actually um kind of reading um a lot of people at the same time you have freudian theories here because you've got the uncanny so this is a very very good representative of the gothic our modern gothic nowadays and very much inclined into looking into the female body as well there's a lot of that not only but there's a lot of that but it's also about memories about things that we forget it's about who we are so we talk here about identity and so important identity nowadays and when we are confined in places when we are trapped in our own houses even though this is pre-pandemic it actually um, helps us a lot to or helps us connect a lot uh, with in, in, you know uh, situations where we feel that are a bit claustrophobic if I have to choose one of the stories, I would choose The Woman Next Door. And that's because it talks about post-traumatic stress. Uh, it's about a woman who's given birth, she's got a very, a very young baby, and then she sees her neighbour who actually has this fantastic figure. Um, she was also given birth recently, like herself, but it looks like the other one is managing a lot better than she is. She feels like she's at home all the time and the other one keeps going out to work, always impeccable, like nothing's have ever happened to her body. And I actually, um, with this story resonated a lot with me because we don't hear much about pregnancy. We don't hear much about women's bodies um, changing. And this is very uncanny. This is actually your home is your body and this body changes while you are harvesting your baby, but also after that. And what happens to your body after you've had this child and it goes back to uh, its normal uh, state. And I, I thought that was beautiful and I thought, yes, I, we need more of that, please, we need more of that. So uh, I encourage other writers to write also on these lines, but that's how it triggered my critical thinking. A lot of the stories there are so much into what happens to us every day that, that it triggers a lot of questions and sometimes you have like open endings, but it definitely contributes to you to your critical thinking and to you finding solutions to all these daily problems that are so close to us. So that's my number one recommendation, my number one book from last year. The second book is actually something a little bit different. We have here um, Contemporary Women's Gothic Fiction by Gina Whisker. Now this is a fantastic book that I had for quite some time, but because it's more of a research and you need to kind of have a bit of background about the gothic although it's not necessary but you have to have some kind of academic interest at least to be able to follow it because there's a lot of there are a lot of references to papers there are a lot of, lots of reference to previous um investigation it's non-fiction obviously it's based on um it's a it's a um, let me see um it's a it makes a scholarly, lifelink, convincing case that the Gothic makes horror respectable. So we have not just the Gothic, but we also have horror here and establishes contemporary women's Gothic fictions in and against traditional Gothic. So we have a lot of references like, for example, Angela Carter, Margaret Atwood, Toni Morrison. And this book actually is what it says here. It, it explores how the Gothic is malleable in the hands, in the hands of these women and these writers and it's used to they mythologize oppressions based on different gender and ethnicity. So I will go, you know, I'm not going to read all the blurb at the back, but it's actually a very good book for those who are researching more into the lines of female Gothic as well in a society, basically patriarchal, etc, etc. Why I read this? As I said, because I'm always investigating about the Gothic in order to know more about the roots, to know more about myself as a writer, to know more about the female mind in the gothic space 
not just nowadays but also in the past and it's a very good book that uh, triggers your critical thinking in the sense that it makes you it creates all these questions uh, as you're reading you you're not just only believing this research or this approaches but you're also questioning if that's the case how do you feel in relation to what you're reading as well does that resonate with you or does it not resonate with you obviously uh, if you are from different countries as well your point of view is going to be different it's not the same uh, a female writer or a female uh, a woman from from the European countries and someone from Africa for example that's why Toni Morrison's point of view um, will be a bit different because uh, culturally historically there's a, a baggage there which is very important we have to take all this into we have to take this into consideration when we're reading uh, women's writing women's uh, gothic writings so i learned a lot of things uh, there are lots of notes on the margins so it actually says in the introduction by by gina whisker it says that this book and it actually what is it tells us about um disease as you know talking about illnesses and disease as as in making us own ease yes she uses this she plays with the sound uh, of of the sound of uh, this disease as in illness and this ease as in making us uncomfortable and she says that disease and uncertainty are key coordinates in gothic literature and she continues saying it shakes us out of blinkered complacencies and encourages questioning so even in this introduction to the research to the rest of the papers we have already this invitation to question things and again questioning things is part of our critical thinking so reading this book is something that helped me understand and to see different angles I had not seen by reading, for example, Toni Morrison, um, Beloved, for example. And I haven't read all of the books that are mentioned here, but it's also a very good way of um, making you want to read other books that you have missed out. But it's fantastic because it's a study, it's, um, it's a scholar book, but anybody with a little bit of academic background can actually follow it and enjoy it very much if you like investigating. Okay, that was my second book of the year that I was reading between other things. As I said before, I didn't just read one and then the other. No, it was happening all at the same time. Um, the next one is going to be, again, Tracy Fahey. I mean, you can tell that I love the woman. I love her work and she's just, she's just amazing. She produced, again, she did it again. Uh, this was released um, for Valentine's Day. And I think I read it... Uh, she passed me a copy so I started reading it before even I got the book but I wanted the physical book uh, I Speed Myself Out by Tracy Fahey wonderful wonderful book and with her beautiful dedication <laughs> again you know there we go the eagle there going so gothic alleys acknowledgement and thanks uh, from the sinister champions yes um, for this I haven't seen it just a sinister champion I, I am sometimes when I can and then also because I was uh, together with other people, I was mentioned there as a, some kind of, what did she say here? Yeah, to the bright phalanx of women who surround me. And there we go. I'm there. My name is there among a lot of other writers and um, supporters as well. This book, this book is lovely in many different ways. I read that obviously because I knew it was something that Tracy had been working on. Uh, I, she'd been, I interviewed Tracy and uh, um, Justine Park, J.R. Park, who's a publisher from this book, The Sinister Horror Company. And um, again, we have a lot of short stories, which is the format that Tracy kind of prefers, uh, because she can express different ideas in different stories. She doesn't have to be I think it doesn't have to be attached to the same idea all the time. But this is a fantastic book where we have even more obvious the body. Um, you feel more at unease when you're reading this. So this unpleasantness that we were reading before here, Tracy plays with that super fantastically, very well. 
there are some stories uh, like the first ones where we have these different body parts in I'll Be Your Mirror. It's fantastic and it makes you kind of uncomfortable, but at the same time, it, it makes you look at our bodies from a different point of view as more of an object when we have been studied to think about um, places like when um, in medical places where people donate their bodies, their bodies for investigation and it makes you think about that and it makes you think about in these first stories more um, about a, a museum here Tracy herself she says that in this story um, being the opener of the collection she says like the anatomical Venus herself it laid out the body like the subject of an autopsy like a series of medical illustrations like a series of stories buried in the flesh so you can imagine how powerful this is and how uncomfortable it makes you how did that contribute with my critical thinking it contributed in my with my critical thinking because it also talks about changes again the female body and the changes like for example menopause and beauty what is beauty what happens when you age all these things that are so trivial looked at sometimes and the society keeps pushing ugliness or not ugliness but growing up keep we keep pushing that and we keep putting ourselves onto a lot under a lot of pressure sorry because we need to always look eternally young so we keep trying all these ways of destroying what naturally is going to happen to our bodies whether we like it or not so it's a lack of acceptance is a social rejection the messages are very very strong in this in this book once again it makes you ask questions about oh my god am i going to be like that do i have any of those traits how do i see my own body i'm also a, at a moment of my life where I've had my children and I've done all this and now it's all going down the hill. So again, we've got the aspect of identity and all this uncanniness. But this one, this is specifically this book, is based on, not so much on, on um, Freud, but more into one of Christeva's, um, Julia Christeva's uh, 1982 essays called The Powers of Horror. Um, because there is where she discusses the notion of the object. I mean, I love this book as well, again, because of the introductory notes and explanatory notes about the, each story at the end as well. So it's beautiful. If I have to choose the one story, it is the one that gives name to the book, which is I Speed Myself Out. And again, this story really, really resonates a lot with me because it's about child loss. And now I've not really spoken much about child loss uh, openly, but that's one of the worst um, moments in my life. I had two, um, not miscarriages, one was an ectopic pregnancy and the other one was an involutive uh, pregnancy. But even though society do not really give voice to those uh, losses, they're actually pretty much present for the mother. And to the father as well but because it happens in the female body we tend to um we tend to blame ourselves for what's happened to that future life that didn't actually happen and the story that actually closes the book but it opens the title is the title of of the whole collection um this baby is already something which is not the same as an unborn child or, or a child that is not even managed to be even created with a hard bit but still it's a loss and that story always brings uh, always brings um uh, tears to my eyes precisely because it's really close it's one of those things that society still keeps still pushes down there's not enough conversation there's no there are not enough groups there's not enough support even among women and it's a very touchy subject considering that tracy herself has never had a child, but she is super empathic and she listens to other people's problems and she puts herself in the shoes and she develops and she resolves the stories so well, so, as, as I said, as if 
it was happening or if it happened to her own body. That is unbelievable. So I recommend you this book. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman or a human being of any form. It doesn't matter whether you identify with one gender or another. It doesn't matter. It's something that happens to the female body. And as a female writer, in a female body, she talks about her experiences and about other women's experiences around her. So read this because it's just beautiful. And it helps you with your critical thinking. Another book now that is into the academic arena is this fantastic book that I bought again like a couple of years ago, but I've not had time to review it, uh, to talk about it, and I'm, I feel very ashamed of myself. This is Horror, a Literary History, edited by Xavier Lana Reyes, and it belongs to the British Library. Now, this is a very, very good book for people who actually want to do like a first contact with horror and the gothic because it tells us about the origin of horror but also uh, you can't help but mention the gothic because horror comes from the gothic and gothic literature it's nicely done it's easy to read it has a lot of um Mm, continue reading uh, messages at the end of each chapter so there is a lot of recommendations of what you should be reading next is some kind of guide why or how did it help me or how it contributed with my critical thinking well it contributed with my critical thinking in linguistically because it spends time it dedicates time to define the difference between horror terror and the gothic and then you can't escape but noticing that they are all intertwined. And we realize that Gothic literature doesn't only start with The Castle of Otranto, because it's the first book that we told that we have to read, because it's The Castle of Otranto, and, and it's the first Gothic book, because that's what the Gothic writer, even the, the writer says, but also because of all the elements, uh, Horace Walpole. But it tells us also about the seeds that were already planted there before and these seeds go back to the uh, graveyard poets that already talked about horror and horror was found in death in the composition of the bodies so or what happens when we die but also the ghostly and this ghostly goes also back to hamlet i mean we can keep going back and back and we will probably realize that these kind of topics uh, have always existed it's just that we gave them a name at the time that we decided or they decided it was decided that a gothic book had certain elements and this happened with Horace Walpole the castle of Otranto um, academically this is where you should probably start reading and in this chronological order you know start maybe with your poets your graveyard poets and then move on to uh, your castle of Otranto, 1700, 1800 and then obviously you're going to go through all the peak of the Victorian times where we have like most work on, on the Gothic but also this book um, guides you, it takes you through what happened then in the state um, um, because we got Edgar Allan Poe, we've got nowadays we have Stephen King so we have all this trajectory and we have this, uh, all this process and all these, yeah, this process and all the progression and how things evolved. We cannot leave on one side film, television, programs here because it's a history, yes, a hi literary history, as it says. And it's very good because it, it makes you, again, it creates questions in your head. And you can't stop connecting ideas with the things that you probably have read and how television had an influence in what we are actually read because sometimes if you think about it we see the film or the program and then we find the book we buy the book and then we read it and then we love finding differences between one and the other um how it triggered my critical thinking again it made me want to read more i had questions i had some answers i had things i agreed with things i didn't agree with but it's fantastic because uh, we also get to the construction of works and like for example from Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies as a deconstruction of the original book so if you kind of know a little bit about your your timeline then when you read certain modern books you realize uh, 
the influences and what other elements are there that they've always been there. So one of the things there that uh, sentences that really um, summarizes why my critical thinking was working is the one that says that all horror, I've got it on my computer, all horror constitutes an enlightened piece of social critique. So that's what it does as well, apart from the language distinction and making very sure, very clear that you understand all the different um, vocabulary and, and all the little um, aspects of the language, is also is telling us how horror and gothic literature is actually like a tool that shows all those things in society that makes us uncomfortable. Lovely. Right, something very different but on the same lines of ghostly things, scary things, is this book that is non-fiction. We go back now to some non-fiction, David Castleton and his book Church Curiosities, Strange Objects and Bizarre Legends. Actually, I was invited to be with him in a program by Marietta Evans. She always, um, every year, she does different um, ghost story programs uh, for the Royal Dogs, the London Royal Dogs, um, the History Club, and it was nice to be there with David this last year. This is not a very big book, and it's more of a factual book about what it says about church curiosities. It's beautifully illustrated and is divided into different sections, and you have things like, for example, uh, the, the legendary skulls, the strange remains, you have uh, giants, graves, old epitaphs and res resurrection men. You have a lot of interesting facts like the fact of, um, you know, when we talk about vampires and people believe that um, sometimes there was this belief that um, vampires existed and therefore uh, they would uh, make sure that the vampire wouldn't come out, so they would put all these great metal grids on top of the the um, the graveyard on top of the tombs um but the thing is that a lot of the times i'm just trying to find a picture for example this one uh yeah this one here for example you can see the green there but it's actually also at the time you know we have like this dual thing yeah, vampire graves, for example, this one is a vampire grave, it's like a pyramid as well. And these, a lot of times, yes, it was because of the belief of vampires, but it was also because uh, the body snatchers in the 18th century, uh, doctors will steal bodies for investigation. So they had to do all these, take these measures so the family members didn't disappear from their graves which is kind of Frankenstein. Yeah, Frankenstein was this. In Frankenstein, we have this, exactly this image um, at the start of building Frankenstein, creating him. So what we have here is a very interesting book for my liking. It's a little bit short, but David Castleton is a, an author that loves details, loves finding out, finding out, sorry, about folklore in, in remote places. It brings out all this folklore that is kind of hidden in the UK and I actually love it. It's fantastic and it's amazing because it, the critical thinking again is why did he do this research and it's because of his own curiosity about all these elements that you can find in churches but also in cathedrals across Britain. That's what he's got, what you've got here and for him everything as a child was uh, interesting to see and he questioned himself uh, and he wanted to know why these elements were there and also because considering that we're talking about sacred places these objects and these legends are so pagan that it's unbelievable for me it's unbelievable this shock in a way so think about it because it's it's kind of interesting so I invite you to read this if you like to, you can use it also like a start, starting point to keep looking into more detail about each of the stories. But a lot of the stories, a lot of the objects have got a lot of folklore behind. And when I'm saying folklore, we have witches, we have giants, as I said before, vampires. So we have a lot of folklore that is taken from reality. That at some point is taken from, from a, a real event that was interpreted or misinterpreted as something else. 
Okay, and then we have something a little bit um, trivial if you want, and you're gonna wonder why did I even read this. Right, The Beauty and the Beast. This is the version of Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont, but actually the original book, which is what I meant to buy, but I made a mistake, was the original, but it was part of the, the more short stories by the original writer, who was Gabrielle Suzanne de Villeneuve, uh, who, with whom I shared birthdays. Uh, yes, she was born in 17 something, I'll tell you right in the article when I write it, uh, 28th of November in 1700s, and I was born 20th of November a few years later. So I've always loved Beauty and the Beast as one of my favorite fairy tales, uh, not because it was the Disney version is the first thing that you watch, but it's because of the gothic elements. Um, you think about the Disney version, you can imagine or you can remember the castle, the gothic castle where the beast is. We have a curse, we have an intelligent girl who doesn't want to marry following tradition, so it's a bit of a damsel in distress, although she's pretty free, but she's a bit oppressed. What we don't see in Disney is that she has sisters and a brother, and this peer or this uh, sibling pressure also plays a role in the story. Well, this is a very short story, and I was a bit disappointed, as I said before, I don't know why I thought it would have been a, a big book. Um, the original is not that different from the adaptations from the film and the cinema. How did it trigger my critical thinking? Well, as I said before, because I was trying to find similarities between the films, film cartoon, and then the film later on uh, in the book. Also because I was intrigued about the elements and also because I found out by keep, you know, when you keep looking, if it was based on anything, why did this woman write this story? It's actually based on a true story of someone called Petrus Gonsalvus. And Petrus Gonsalvus had a, an illness called hypertrichosis. I don't know if I'm saying this right. Anyway, it had an illness that meant that he, he had a lot of bodily hair. In the pictures, if you look at any pictures of Petrus, you will see that mainly it's like a little werewolf, is depicted like a werewolf with a fairy face. Uh, a fairy face, no, with a hairy face, not fairy, a hairy face, <laughs> sorry about that. And the hands, surprisingly, when you look at the paintings and the portraits of this person, the hands are actually not hairy at all, but normally the illness uh, would mean that the whole of the body is hairy. I would actually recommend you to read about the this, um, the origins of the, 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 it's based on a true story, because it's very interesting what happened to the real beast and that he actually did marry and it was an arranged marriage where they had kids and the, hit, the kids also inherited the father's illness and they were also like the father, they were, they were sold. Think about it, circus time, Victorian times again, 1700s plus and we get these things that people did to other people. That's how you also get your critical thinking and uh, moving, you, you comparing how people reacted to certain certain physical illnesses or physical differences and how these affected the identity of the person suffering it, but also the people outside and how this other that is so gothic works and works in society up to the point that we got a book and a story that we love. At least I do. The next book, and the pile is going down, the next book is Shirley Jackson, The Haunting of Hill House. Why am I talking about Shirley Jackson? Well, Shirley, Shirley Jackson is not because um, we had Netflix making us all watch things that we didn't even know existed. Also because this is one of the favorite readings by Tracy Fahey, <laughs> and since you know that I love Tracy, then I investigate her references, her preferences, and sometimes I even read what she recommends and what she's read to, to see also her influence and how her writing has got this influence. The thing is that it's a beautiful copy and even the, the pages are like serrated, like they've been caught by hand. 
and not just because it's physically beautiful this edition but I have to say that like a lot of my students because I use this book precisely in class to help my students with their language and also to engage them with something that they could refer to because we could watch the adaptation in on Netflix um, I was like they were at the start a little bit uh, shocked and even disappointed because in the book or the book is a lot more eerie than the series which I loved the series I love them and I suppose having watched that first when you read this you are disappointed because you don't really see all the elements although it's very faithful in the names of the characters the purpose why the characters are there are different but I have to say that the series catches very well and defines very well the role of the house and the house again we have this uncanny element that I can see also on Tracy uh, in, Tra in Tracy's writings and this uncanny element of the house as another character and how it influences the characters inside it so because it refers to is a it's a ghost story and ghost stories are complicated to elaborate because of the certain elements that's why I like it so much although I have to admit I will have to read it again because I still wanted to see some ghosts I still wanted to see them described but that's the beauty about not describing is that your imagination is doing all the work and it's making you think well how much of what I'm reading is actually because I, I'm biased, because I'm expecting a ghost there? How much is actually the projection of the, projection of the uh, character? How much of what we see is being manipulated by the psychologist, the doctor that is here? Mm, there are a lot of elements that actually trigger your critical thinking and ghost stories, and as I said before, this one particularly does that very well so another recommendation for you and that's why I read it I read it for various reasons right the next one and we're going now back to going in, into the year this is now we're talking about June we're talking about July after having interviewed uh, Tracy and then Justin who's her um, publisher uh, JR Park I thought I had to read J.R. Park as well. Even though I had already read some of his short stories, I decided that after the interview that we had, so go, please watch that. After an interview, I had to read about Mad Dog. Mad Dog is a book for werewolf fans, so I let that go. We have werewolves this time, we have werewolves in the modern times, we have references to Michael Jackson thriller, we have references to mental illnesses. We have references to what happens when you get a bunch of men in, in a prison. It's horror. And as such, is, uh, there's a lot of bodily fluids, a lot of bodily disgraceful de definitions. Thank you, J.R. Park, for this. But you cannot put the book down because it's very cleverly done. We have different multiple voices, different people talking from their point of view. It's like a diary. Again, following the Victorian description, the Victorian format of diary writing, uh, we have different multiple points of view. So that plays again with your critical thinking because you have multiple points of view, which is what critical thinking does as well. And these different points of view lead to you start asking questions and trying to figure out what is really happening. Uh, and you get a lot of different hypotheses and and. Justin and Park tends to do this uh, sometimes with the next book also that I'm going to talk to you about. He also does that. So um, he mentions a balance of, you know, it makes you think, well, who believes in science here? Who believes in the supernatural? Folklore appears again. Uh, people's beliefs appear again. But also medicine and also um other beliefs like non-pagan beliefs like Christian beliefs as well so are we all monsters in the inside uh, on the inside sorry which is a question we have here or it's a statement we're all monsters on the inside even though we might not necessarily look like a monster we are monsters and how people can see us 
is what will describe us as this werewolf figure or as any other kind of monster that we can relate to. So again, and another reading is very easy to read. I have to warn you about the swearing words, but it's got to be that way, my dears, because we are in a prison and in prison people, well, we have people of all sorts of backgrounds and not very polite, let's say. It's lovely to show you some of the images inside. Um, Park is always super careful with the covers, with the divisions of the pages, with the footnotes, with everything. Footnotes with the divisions, the fragments. Right, another J.R. Park that, you know, this is what happens to me. I talk to an author and then they tell me I'm writing another book. I'm like, right, this is going to be my chance to be the first one doing a review. And we had just been talking. He'd just been telling me about, and uh, telling me and Tracy about the company of words. And I wanted to have this fantastic edition. Uh, hardcover is a special one because it's got notes. So that's why I loved it. Because with this book, I challenge myself. I challenge my own critical thinking by actually uh, reading it from a different point of view. Uh, and all by mistake. I mean, look at the glossy pages. Oh, there's a dedication there as well. I wanted to, I didn't want to write on this one. You know, I'm one of those people who on the line uh, writes uh, notes on the sides. I know some will probably hate me for this, but I don't care. That's what I do with books. Um, but this one's got like the shiny glossy pages and I didn't want to spoil them. So what I actually did, and it's got, again, it's got little beautiful images there. What I did with that one was to, okay, I, I journaled, and again, it's the dedication for me. I journaled the my thoughts while I was reading it. So I did that because I knew that there were notes about the making of. This is Justin, in case you want a picture of Justin Park. There you go. Um, there, you know, I... Having the notes at the end, which is, I didn't cheat, I read the notes at the end. I wanted to see if I could actually pick on Justin's brains. And he's always three or four steps ahead of me. But sometimes I manage to impress him or to say, ah, it's a ha and a ha moment that you might have not thought of. And I love when that happens as well. And with the company of words, he's playing a little bit with the reader's perception, which again, for your critical thinking is very good. Because you can see that how a story can be written from different angles. Again, you know, Justin likes these different points of view. There tends to be a lot of testosterone on his books, but I don't mind. I don't mind because at the end of the day, we have uh, male minds, uh, mainly for what I've read so far. Although he's got the stories where um, there are different characters and it's pretty balanced. Um, but in, in this case, in this case, and in, in Mad Dog, Again, we have a group of men, we have experiments, we have a house, we have monsters, we have memories. Again, he's very much influenced by Tracy at this stage. He is, is just in and he knows and he says so. He's very influenced by Tracy. And it's beautiful because then we don't just get the horror, which is all the bodily descriptions, but we also get the the gothic which is more insinuating it's more about the sounds it's more about your memories the memories play a big role here as well there are a lot of gothic elements like the rain and and then this surprise factor at the end that is okay did you get the idea of what i was doing or not some people were disappointed some people like myself i wanted more can he continue this can he do a lot more yeah probably but maybe he just wants to keep it like this so that's how he triggered my critical thinking. He triggered it because I wanted to see for myself if I had been asking the right questions, if I had got the right answers, and why was he doing what he was doing. That was very important for me as well. I wanted to see what he was actually doing, and I learned a lot from that. I mean, I learned a lot from all of these books for different reasons, and I've already elaborated, but from this one, I actually feel that I did one of my best reviews, my best book reviews with this book. And I think he was actually actually quite happy as well. So then in that sense, I grew as a, as a reviewer, as a, as a writer, 
that was another step for me. So that's why I said at the beginning of the videos that I also learned and changed me these books. And the last one, and I've got my little plate here. My last one is got to be a Spanish book. Yes, we've got here Carlos Rizafón, who unfortunately he, he passed away a couple of years ago, if I don't remember wrong. And it's got to be La Sombra del Viento, so the shadow of the wind in English, if you want to read it in English. Uh, Carlos Rizafón, he's a magician with a pen. He's fantastic. I mean, considering it's such a big book, it, you can't put it down. Um, it's great because it belongs, it's very clever as well, it belongs to uh, the Cementerio de los Libros Olvidados, so the Cemetery of the Forgotten Books, which means that there are other books that will make part of the same story, but you can read them individually, so in that sense it's very clever. Um, is set in 1945. We have a child who is taken to a, a dark, we have already gothic elements here, a dark place in Barcelona, so hometown for me. And in this place is the Forgotten Books place where the main character finds a story that he starts pulling the strings out of and, and then he discovers, he discovers a lot of secrets. Considering how many um, characters there are and uh, how complicated the story can get. It's very well done, it's very well written. It doesn't let, it doesn't leave any thread behind. It, everything is really well round up at the end. Uh, and for me, this is like one of those books that I read as a teenager where I had this sensation of this feeling of looking at the story with new eyes discovery, going back to my own roots as well, the, the style of the Spanish writer uh, that I was missing, that uh, no, there are not many writers that I like, but for example, like I, la I love Camila Forenada, I like these at the same level. It was fast, it was engaging, it was a wonderful, a lot of gothic elements and I'm really proud that we have a Spanish writer writing gothic also um, because it reminded me of a, not a gothic element per se because we cannot say that it's a gothic element what we call here Esperpento which was um, created by by Yin Clan and Esperpento has this dark um, characteristic the Spanish uh, dark humor that you get in the worst of the moments and when we most um there's poverty and so we have the grotesque we have um harsh reality uh we have multiple uh like the national concept there and and like the very core of the traditional um spanish mentality um that we prefer to laugh in front of the worst moments. So even in the worst, more drastic situations, we could even laugh. And we have these these very grotesque paintings in in paintings because I'm thinking of Goya, but grotesque descriptions in that time of buying clan, as I said. So this is my list of books that I recommend you read this year and this is the book of list of books that I read this year among other things that I've been reading that I'm not going to mention because they are on yeah I also read Emilia Pardo Bazan short stories oh, I think I read that last year but that was a, an, an e-book that was a, an electronic book so this is in my friends the books for this year and I hope you have enjoyed this I know it's a bit long but you have all my explanations of why I read them, what I've learned from them, how to improve your critical thinking reading these things. And I hope that they've made you think. And I hope that you now feel intrigued to read my PDF, which is free, that talks about how to improve your critical thinking reading Gothic literature. And this is a good example. That PDF is a little bit more basic. Is not for people who are learning English as a second language, but not necessarily only for them, because there are a lot of uh, tips 
and tools that you can use to enhance and to make the most of your reading. So thank you very much and um, I'm really glad that you are in this new section that we have inaugurated today called You Are Gothic But You Don't Know It. I think I forgot to say that right at the start, but you are gothic, you don't know it. This is Alice in Gothic Land, a place where your soul finds its true self. I hope you've enjoyed it. See you next day, same time, same place. Until then, be very gothic and enjoy it. See you soon. Bye-bye.